what is the difference between this picture and this picture? I don't know. What is faith, and were the Reformers at odds with ancient Hebrews, including Paul, on their working definition? Bro, what are you talking about, man? If you haven't already seen this video on Paul's use of the phrase, obedience of faith, I encourage you to check it out, as it will help you come to a better understanding of how Paul used obedience as a synonym for faith in Romans. If you do watch that video, it will clue you in on much of the nuance in these terms as they were used in the Bible and later on in post-Renaissance Europe by those like the Reformers. Also, please like, share, and subscribe if you like this video. I'd greatly appreciate it, and you'll help me to continue to make this kind of content. With that in mind, how exactly would you define faith? Certainly the word carries with it a wide range of meaning, and this may be a bit of a generalization, but it seems to me that a post-Enlightenment Western world wants to restrict faith to the realm of the human brain. In other words, it's just a mental function. Stop it. Get some help. This sums up the mentality behind the person who has no problem living in gross, negligent sin and suggesting, what does it matter? All I need to do is believe in Jesus, right? <laughs> yes, this was an actual conversation I had with someone recently. In that construct, faith is thinking only. It has zero implications on my actions or my attitude about holiness. Now, if you've studied Reformational theology at all, you know they were well aware that they would be criticized for promoting this precise kind of cheap grace empowered by a junk faith. And that's why they went through painstaking measures to very clearly define the kind of faith they felt produced declarative justification. All of this brings me to my first image. It's the image of Jesus holding you. That's right, you, his sheep. Nonetheless, in working on those videos, Polycarp slapped me in the face with this scripture right here. The reason this was so challenging for me is that he seemed to use the word belief in this particular sentence in a very active sense, or in the sense of believing as in practicing the faith. Certainly, I don't think he was suggesting true faith produced salvation could be lost, a topic I hope to explore deeper in a not-so-distant video. The whole perseverance of the saints thing, and do we see it in the Father's? But nonetheless, we have here a very dynamic use of the term, and one I believe, did you see what I did there, would fit into how the word is used in other places, specifically in other places in the Bible, surprisingly, by Paul. Here's one of those places in which Paul tells the Corinthian Christians, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Now, may I ask you, what does Paul mean by the word believed here? In the Greek, it's the verb form of the noun faith, pistis. Again, I ask this because in a modern context, we tend to think of belief as just thinking the correct things, or maybe even faith as in the journey sense of things. Oh no! Please, no! Y'all know what I'm talking about. Don't stop Yet Paul here seems to be talking about members of the Corinthian church who were walking in error, not just believing improper doctrine, nor just losing their passion. No, this was a common problem in the first century. People would start faithfully marching into the new covenant only to backslide right into Moses. Are our actions the direct outflow of what's happening on the inside? Absolutely. But my point is that the idea of faith and its ancient Hebrew usage were more dynamic than our journey faith, which, by the way, still has a little bit of what I'm talking about. Don't stop believing actually means don't stop moving forward. Don't give up on your dream. Keep pursuing. Keep crushing. This is what I think Paul sometimes means by belief. Case in point, when he said something similar to the Galatians, are you so foolish after beginning by means of the spirit, i.e. the new covenant, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh, the old covenant? Have you experienced 
so much in vain, if it really was in vain. So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Do you see here how he's saying the same thing to the Galatians, except that he's likening believing to the experience of faith? In my opinion, the idea of faith has an experience or practice of faith that emphasizes outward signs. This use of the word opens the door for a person to have a type of faith outwardly without true inward saving faith. And it also explains why they walk away. In other words, they are outwardly and covenantally part of God's people, but they are not on the inside. This faith is fake. Consequently, they backslide. These are the ones to whom Paul is speaking in these perseverance passages. Okay, all of this brings me to these two pictures. The first of which is the classic image of Jesus holding a lost sheep lovingly in his arms. This is the image I think most embodies the Reformed understanding of true saving faith, about which most Reformed teachers will see three components. Number one, an object of faith, meaning Jesus, with the proper message of faith, meaning the gospel. Number two, mental agreement. And yes, mental agreement is necessary. It's just that it doesn't end there. Remember, the demons have this kind of faith in James 2. And number three, true saving faith must have an extra step of willful trust in Jesus and his message. This is often referred to as fiduciary faith coming from the Latin legal terminology. Note this explanation by Calvin. The true knowledge of Christ consists in receiving him as he is offered by the Father, namely as invested with the gospel. Since one of the first elements of faith is reconciliation implied in a man's drawing near to God, Faith cannot possibly be disjoined from pious affection. Do you see how Calvin explains faith as the actions of the sinner to cling to Christ in the sense of trusting him? This is fiduciary faith. Likewise, the Westminster Shorter Catechism defines faith this way. Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. Again, the resting and receiving of Christ in a heartfelt way by the lost sinner. Notice, however, the absence of any action language. We don't see faith here described as a tearing down of an altar or actually taking a leap of faith in any other than a spiritual sense. Well, this is where our first image comes in. I think this is the Protestant understanding of faith. However, does this line up with how the Hebrews, you know, the writers of Scripture understood faith? This is really the litmus test for our theology, right? Is it biblical? Since, as I've already shown you in part, I think the Hebrews did see a fuller sense, one that looks like this. Do you see the difference Reformed faith and biblical faith, do they contradict? Well, I think one of the ways we might find a contradiction, if we are looking for one, is in the construct created by the justification as vindication structure many Protestants make of James chapter 2, in which they suggest James and Paul are using justification in different senses— In this mindset, works vindicate the true faith of a believer, but what if the problem doesn't lie with the way we read justification, but with our understanding, or lack thereof, of true ancient biblical belief, aka faith? And I think this is actually where the problem lies, because I think James, like Paul, is teaching justification by faith alone, except the example he gives is that of faith in action. Now, there are still many issues to do a deep dive on here that I don't have time to address in this video, such as was Abraham justified multiple times or what is justification and how does it work? Sorry, everyone, I'm staying on point here. Nonetheless, our definition of faith is an important distinction to make. And as Jonathan Edwards from the Reformed Tradition notes, James opens the door for a more dynamic understanding of faith, one which the Hebrews often did a 
part for the whole thing by using faith in action as an example of faith. Take a look at what he said here in his work, Justification by Faith Alone. Take notice of the great unfairness of those that oppose us in the improvement they make of this passage against us. All will allow that in that proposition of St. James, by works a man is justified and not by faith only. One of those terms, either the word faith or else the word justify, is not to be understood precisely in the sense as the same terms when used by St. Paul, because they suppose, as well as we, that it was not the intent of the Apostle James to contradict St. Paul in that doctrine of justification by faith alone in which he had instructed the churches. He continues, The sign of a thing is often in Scripture language said to be that thing, as it is in that comparison by which James illustrates it. Not the actions themselves of a body are properly the life or spirit of the body, but the active nature of which those actions or motions are the signs is the life of the body. That which makes men pronounce anything to be alive is that they observe it has an actual operative nature which they observe no otherwise than by the actions or motions which are the signs of it. It is plainly the apostles' aim to prove that if faith has not works, it is a sign that it is not a good sort of faith. And then listen to this, which would not have been to his purpose if it was his design to show that it is not by faith alone. Those were his words on James 2. But notice here what I was saying. Edwards confirming this tendency of the Hebrews in their culture to speak in a more dynamic and sometimes symbolic way than we do in a modern Western context. Here you see the sign for things signified observation in which the actions are identified as faith itself. Additionally, notice how he at least seems to be suggesting that James, like Paul, actually teaches justification by faith alone. James is certainly using the language differently than Paul, works actually meaning faith alone, yet conceptually, this certainly seems to be the case. And Edwards, again, a Reformed thinker, seems to open the door for this understanding with these words. If notwithstanding, any choose to take justification in St. James precisely as we do in Paul's epistles, what has already been said concerning the manner in which acts of evangelical obedience are concerned in the affair of our justification affords a very easy, clear, and full answer. For if we take works as acts or expressions of faith, they are not excluded. So a man is not justified by faith only, but also by works, i.e., he is not justified only by faith as a principle in the heart, or in its first and more imminent acts, but also by the effective acts of it in life, which are the expressions of the life of faith, as the operations and actions of the body are of the life of that agreeable to James 2.26. And so this is literally my only contention. Faith alone is undeniable from the scriptures and in the fathers. Check out this video if you haven't already. It's just that clearly the ancient Hebrews had a different way of conceptualizing things than we do. And now back to our original question. Are we less reformed noticing this, particularly in the area of soteriology? No! Is this different from... This? I don't think so. Don't stop because we're really just talking about the differences in the way two people groups separated by several centuries talk about things. And all we're really saying at this point is that faith is most basically an act of the human heart that trusts Jesus and the gospel, or obeys Jesus and the gospel, get more on that in this video. From there, we're admitting that saving faith produces actions. This is certainly not in disagreement with the Reformed tradition, which believes in this so strongly that we teach perseverance of the saints. And finally, we're noticing that for the ancient Hebrews, the thing was often identified as the thing signified in common language. Nothing controversial, right? I don't think so. Just take a look at this powerful statement by Luther on the nature of faith. Faith is not the human notion and dream that some people call faith. Oh, it is a living, busy, active, mighty thing, this faith. It is impossible for it not to be doing good works incessantly. It does not ask whether good works are to be done, but before the question is asked, 
it has already done them and is constantly doing them. Whoever does not do such works, however, is an unbeliever. And this is the work which the Holy Spirit performs in faith. Because of it, without compulsion, a person is ready and glad to do good to everyone, to serve everyone, to suffer everything out of love and praise to God who has shown him this grace. Thus, it is impossible to separate works from faith quite as impossible as to separate heat and light from fire. That is from Martin Luther's preface of Paul's epistle to the Romans. Notice Luther's view of faith as a powerful force in the life of a believer, one that is doing, working, moving the believer along into good works. It would be fair to say that Luther would want to make a distinction between faith and works. However, my point is simply that with this powerful definition of faith, we can admit how the ancients might have sometimes identified the essence of a thing by its outward activity. I say this as long as we understand that the outward activity springs forth from within and that there is no meritorious value in the outward or inward actions of faith. So there's your answer. This does not contradict this. In fact, this is this, and this is this, and that's that. It's an understanding we should take to the scriptures. It will destroy easy believism, if nothing else. With that, I hope you enjoyed this video, friends. Hopefully it cleared some things up for you, or at the very least gave you something to think about or study further. As always, it was great to gospel with you.